I wanted to talk to you guys about conservation tonight and about technology. I am currently working on a project and have been for the last two years called the Terra Project. Um, has anybody heard of the Terra Project? A little bit? Okay. So, <laughs> good, thanks. Um, the Terra Project is really uh, something that has taken over my life and has been really exciting to work on. It has a huge amount of potential and we're just getting started. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys about that tonight. Um, before I do that, though, I want to just talk a little bit about how we got here, um, both individually and as a, as a culture and as human beings since about 350 BC. So we'll start there, start at the beginning. Um, I promise it'll be quick. It won't take 1,300 years. It might seem like 1,300 years to you, but it won't take that long, actually. Um, so this is, our, this is my talk. And first, I want to just bring up this question, which is really the primary question that we've had um, since as long, I imagine, as people have been around, is where do birds go? And I think that um, it's a really fundamental question, and it seems like a fairly simple one until you try to answer it in specifics, and then it gets really complicated. So I think, again, from the beginning, you can see on the left there, that's actually a shot from Cape May of tree swallows. We get these huge, like, 10 to 20,000 bird flocks there at a, at, in the fall, usually, and they'll start to swarm around before they migrate. And then they're gone. And it looks like the bottom right picture there where everything's, you know, just no, no tree swallows. So the question is, where do they go? And um, you can imagine without technology or good optics or a worldwide communication system, it would be hard to know. So people have tried to figure it out for a long time. So during the Roman era, they actually had a fairly large chunk of land called the Roman Empire. And what was interesting about that was short distance migrants they could actually see because you would see them like this vulture, you would see it in Spain and then you might see it later in the year in Morocco essentially. So you could see these sort of migrations happening. So there's some idea that birds moved a bit, but for a bird like the barn swallow, that bird would be in Europe and then it would be gone and really gone. And you could go as far south as you wanted and you would never see it again. So they started to come up with explanations for themselves just to figure out why that might, that might be. So here's a, um, a gentleman named Aristotle. You guys might've heard of him. He did a whole bunch of, I have a whole nother talk about taxonomy, which I'll, I'll spare you guys, but I'll give you a really extremely short one slide summary of Aristotle. Um, he, um, he came up with a lot of stuff, including our first um, taxonomy, essentially, our first organized taxonomy. And he also had hypotheses about where birds went. So he had a couple of ideas. One, he thought that birds changed into other birds um, at different parts of the year. So he thought they transmuted, which sounds really funny, right? Except that if you've ever seen a chestnut-sided warbler now and a chestnut warbler sided in, in the fall, they look really, really different, right? So you could easily mistake them for two different birds. It's not such a crazy idea, but I think he was taking a little further than it needed to go. Um, they also thought maybe they nested in hollows and trees. There was this hypothesis that they were, you know, hibernating because you see other animals hibernate, so why not? Some people even thought that they would go to the bottom of lakes and go in the mud and actually live under the lake during the winter time and then come back out. And we have frogs that do that. They don't have wings, but you know, why not? Amazing. I'm gonna jump forward now about uh, 1600 years and we're gonna find this stork. Now this is called a rock star stork. <laughs> These birds were, um, there's a number of them actually. And this was one of the first clues people had about migration um, that was like sort of a physical evidence of what was happening. This bird was found in Germany right and it lives in the summer in europe and then they migrate actually to africa in the in the winter time and that spear is a um, spear from someone who tried to kill that stork in africa and the spear is specific to a certain tribe in africa so when they found the stork with the spear in it they said oh he went there and that sure enough that's what was happening and they found out that these storks were actually getting, you know, this stork somehow survived and flew all the way back to Germany again. So, yeah, crazy. There's a bunch of them. There's actually a museum in Germany you can go to and see a few of them. Um, this is, anybody know who that is? He's pretty, he looks really grouchy, right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's Audubon. 
Um, yeah, that's John Audubon. And so he, um, in 1805, he actually took those little silver wires and wrapped them around an Eastern Phoebe and banded it. And so that was, it wasn't the first example of banding, but it's actually maybe one of the first examples in the United States. And uh, that Eastern Phoebe flew away and then came back the next year and it still had that wire around his leg, so he knew it was the same bird. And so he was uh, doing these sort of scientific approach to figuring this out and started this idea of banding in the US. So um, we think that is actually the first North American bird that was banded. This gentleman is uh, Dr. Paul Barsh. He actually did the first banding project in the United States in, I think it was 19, let me see on my notes, 19, Two, um, and they actually he actually banded a bunch of black crown night herons in Washington D.C. and had them leave and come back and recaptured a couple of them. So they was sort of one of the first recapture banding efforts. Um, he that led to the creation of what we now have, which is a national banding program, um, which was officially started in the 20s after the um, uh, the Federal Bird Protection Act, which happened in 1916, after they wiped out a whole bunch of birds for hats and feathers and stuff and decided they didn't want to do that anymore. He is, uh, as a little known fact, he's actually a very close relative of um, Gomez Adams from the <laughs> Adams family. I don't know if you guys knew that. There is a resemblance. Um, and um, this is an example. Has anybody ever done any banding here or been to a banding station? Okay. Oh my goodness. Wow. There's a lot of banders in here. So this is what banding looks like. You catch a bird in a net and then you bring it inside and hope, or to your table and you put a little metal ring or plastic ring around its leg, I guess metal, and then they take off and then hopefully you catch it again or someone else catches it again. And, and the band has a number on it so you know where the bird was caught and you can look it up and get some information that way. Um, it's something that people have been doing for, um, those are called mist nets. And the birds get caught in those nets. They usually set them up in a little flyway in the woods and they extract them very carefully. Um, it actually is, has a very high success rate. Like it doesn't, birds don't die very often in that kind of process, so it's relatively safe. But nevertheless, you have to handle the birds and it takes a lot of expertise to do it properly. And also it has a very low return rate, which I'll talk about in a minute. But that's one of the primary ways that we've learned about birds for the last hundred years. So. Um, banning is a massive endeavor. We have, I think, let's see, 1.2 million birds in North America are banded annually. Um, and we recover, and actually 63 million total since the banning program was started. So it's a massive effort by a lot of really dedicated people who care about birds and want us to learn more about them and conservation. And um, it's been the primary way that we've learned about what, where birds go and what they do. So that's one way that we figured out. The drawbacks are that you have to catch the bird. So that requires, again, expertise, permits, and experience, and you have to have people go out for hundreds of hours in the field catching these birds. Um, the data is just for one bird. So if you um, band a bird, you'll find about, uh, out, hopefully, about what that one bird did, but it doesn't tell you what all the birds are doing. You have to extrapolate that. And their capture rate is 7%. So oh, wow. it's very, very small. And it's very lucky to recapture these birds. So you're sort of relying on volume to get enough information. Um, and also, there's no root information, right? You can catch the bird here, and then someone can pick it up in Central America and tell you it's there. But you don't know where it went in between. So you don't know what it's. Um, feeding grounds are, what its stopover points are, which are actually really critical to know about because in terms of conservation, we want to protect the areas that birds use when they're traveling. Um, there's a number of birds, we believe now, who have uh, molting grounds in addition to their final stopover in their southern wintering grounds. So, you know, there's multiple areas we want to protect and you don't really learn about those this way. So then we got this thing called telemetry, and that's just using a radio signal to find an animal, right? So um, you've probably seen this where you have, has anybody ever done this kind of work with a telemetry you have? So you have the receiver and you walk out there and it beeps, and as it beeps more, you get closer to the animal. And you can use this for studying, um, uh, especially mammals and, and larger animals you can use it for. And actually it was 
you know, originally used on large terminals because the units are large. So you don't have tiny units for telemetry that you can put on birds when it was started in the 50s. You had to use, you know, larger units. So it was for bigger animals. But you could use it to track. I, I knew someone who was tracking um, uh, rattlesnakes in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. And so they could actually see where they went. You know, they would go, you know, actually surprising distances. They would have to go out and find them. Um, again, very time intensive. Um, um, but effective for, um, you know, um, smaller scale studies of movements, local movements of animals. Then we have this uh, project where we started to use the same telemetry, but on a more miniaturized scale. So over the years, we were able to make radio transmitters, essentially. And we've gotten them now to the point where this is a, there's a hummingbird on the upper left with one on its back. It's actually a solar panel on the back. Those um, little devices weigh, it's l literally just a couple of grams. You know, they can weigh maybe five grams. The rule for birds is you don't want to put anything more than 3% of their body weight on them because we found that if you do more than that, it stresses the animal to the point where it can affect its, you know, life. So you don't want to do that. So you have to use these teeny tiny things, but those things are solar powered and they have a little antenna off the back. So when that bird goes out, anytime he passes one of these within you know, a certain distance of one of these MODIS stations, MODIS is just the name of the project, they're radio receivers that you set up. We have one actually here at McGee, which picks up birds. Um, it'll ping off of it, and then we'll know the bird's there. And when we do that, we can get so much more detailed information about where the birds go, right? Um, because you can actually pick them up in all these different places where they might pass. Now, the problem is that you have to have a lot of motor stations out there, right? Because if you only have two motor stations, you really have to get lucky to have the bird go. So you really want to have hundreds of them right now or thousands. Right now, there's about 1,300 motor stations out there. That number's continuously growing. And the number of animals with these tags on them is 31,000. So um, it's, and that's also growing quickly. So um, that's a way of studying animals and how they fly in a much more specific way and using technology to see where they go um, more accurately. Now there's something else you can do with this, which is you can actually store data on these little devices and they can actually ping back data about where the bird was more specifically. You can actually use things like sunrise and sunset to help determine location. So if it's reading the amount of light that it's receiving, it can actually um, collect data like that. So then it can actually ping back to the motor station even more information about where the bird has been. So we've gone from where do they go, I have no idea, to where do they go, I think they go south, to where do they go, oh, they go to this specific place south. And now we're getting to the point where we're saying, um, where do they go? They go south and they also take this route, right? Which is really, again, really important information and stuff that we want to know. It's not a given, by the way. I mean, this is the thing is, feels like this kind of science feels like it's, uh, it's done in a way, you know, like we figured out how to radio tag birds so now we know everything. It's actually not at all. <laughs> um, Stellar Zyder is a bird that we had no idea where they went to until about 20 years ago. Um, and uh, that's a really interesting story. They actually had a couple of, they, they put radio tags on some birds and had them take off and they would be in Alaska in the summer, but in the winter they would go away and nobody knew where they went. I mean, this is in the 2000s so we, and we still didn't know. And some people working up there actually put a couple of bands on these birds. I think they put maybe a dozen bands on birds. Only two of those bands kept working. The batteries died on all the rest of them. And um, they all stopped for a while. And then a couple of them turned on and sent out a ping signal. And it was in the middle of the Bering Sea. So they said, well, that can't be right. But they got a plane and they flew out there in the Arctic winter. And sure enough, there was the majority of the world's stellar rider population in the middle of the Bering Sea actually using their body heat to create openings in the ocean water and feeding off all the mussels and bivalves that are there and living there through the whole winter. So incredible survival story, but also just shows you, Connecticut warblers, another one, we don't really even know now exactly where they, I mean, they go to the Amazon basin, we believe, but we could use more information about exactly what they're doing. So, um, so it's, not a, it's not a finished project yet, and that's part of the reason we're still working on it. Um, 
these are MODIS towers, so you can actually see like coverage in the Northeast. This is New Jersey and New York and uh, part of Pennsylvania, and each one of those little yellow band areas is coverage by a MODIS station. Um, now satellites, this is pretty cool. We have the Argo system and the Iridium system. Have you guys heard of like Iridium phones? That's the same satellite system. And we can use that satellite phone technology to actually put satellite trackers on birds. So that redhead there actually has a satellite on its back. This is a satellite tracker that will just ping up to a satellite its GPS location wherever it is. So then, that's kind of amazing, right? Because now you know exactly where the bird is, and as long as you can get enough pings back, you know, as long as you have enough battery power to keep sending signals, you can watch exactly where it goes and how it behaves. And that's pretty incredible technology. Um, there, is a, there are a few drawbacks to it. There's a corollary to it, which is cellular, and actually that's Mike Lenzone. He's one of the co-founders of Terra. Um, he owns a company called Cellular Tracking Technologies, and they make these trackers. Um, and they got, they sort of made their bones making trackers for gold eagles, which you see right there, and they use cell towers. So they figure, well, instead of using all these radio towers that we have to put out ourselves, why don't we just use the cell network? And so he literally took apart cell phones and sort of made his own little cellular transmitter and put it on a golden eagle. And sure enough, they got incredibly detailed information about where that bird was going every 30 seconds or less, you know. Um, and so they could see the exact track the bird takes. And the reason they developed that actually was because they're putting um, uh, wind turbines up on ridges. And so they needed to know um, where they should put the turbines that weren't gonna disturb the eagles. Because the eagles and other raptors use those ridges for migration. They need to know that the eagles aren't gonna be following the same path as where they're gonna put the turbines, right? So they, but the satellite transmissions and the other stuff they had then didn't give them enough detailed information. They would just give you a ping like every five minutes or 10 minutes. But the problem with that is the bird could have traveled, you know, miles and miles in five or 10 minutes. With this, we could actually see the exact path they take along a ridge. So like, that's one of the paths. You can see the bird actually following the ridge, going up, following a thermal, spiraling on the thermal, and then coming back down again. I mean, it's really incredibly detailed information, and that was super helpful for figuring out that problem. So we continue to make those silt trackers at CTT. Oh, this is actually a cool video. This is um, a pair of golden eagles, right? And this is a real, a real track that we had. And we were, so we can follow one bird. And then that other bird is also a golden eagle. And these two birds came up briefly, met each other, and then did this kind of dance together, followed a spiral up a thermal here and then split apart and went in other directions. Oh so, so amazing, right? I mean, you can basically see the bird in the air. <laughs> it's, it's really incredible. So what are the draw, I mean, this seems great, right? Like this sort of solves all our problems. We just put these satellite trackers on everybody and we'll know exactly what's going on. Well, not exactly. For one thing, um, they take even more effort and expertise than banding, right? So you, you have to, create these tags and you have to know how to put them on these birds without harming the birds. You also have to catch the bird and put it on them. Um, they use these big, for the, um, for the golden eagles, they use these giant bow traps or sometimes even these um, explosive traps that fire like sandbags attached to a net and it like goes sort of like what you would imagine in like a cops and robbers movie from the 70s or something. They have like a net gun or, from, or like uh, Planet of the Apes. You ever see them shoot them with a net gun? It's like that. Um, so it's, it's not easy. And the tags are super expensive. They range from $200 to $5,000 a piece. So you can't just put them on a whole bunch of birds easily. You have to be fairly selective about it. And again, the data is just for one bird, right? We're just following one bird's behavior, and then we have to sort of extrapolate from that. Okay, I guess that's what all golden eagles do, but you can't be sure of that for sure. Um, so. That brings us to another big development in technology, which is um, community science. And that's actually what's happening right here in this room, is you have a bunch of birders, 
And they said, well, we've got all these people in the field looking all the time, right? People who are excited about birds and want to tell other people about them. And you've got them finding birds for us all over the country and the world. So if they just report that data, we're going to have essentially millions of sentient trackers walking around picking up birds for us. And that's what eBird did. So eBird you know, got started probably, I don't know, was it 20 years ago about? something like that, um, and uh, maybe less, and has since grown into this huge project, right? Where, how many people hear eBird? Oh my goodness, wow. Okay, that's a lot of people. So, and you know what, if I asked that six or seven years ago, it would have been a third of that number. So it just continues to grow. And um, it's a great way to harness um, people's activity um, and so there's all these apps that will let people, um, that involve people in birding and help them contribute to science essentially. And there's a lot of birds, a lot of apps that will teach you about animals too. I slipped in the Warbler Guide app there. Um, and um, iNaturalist, you guys use iNaturalist, everybody use iNaturalist. If you don't use it, you should get it. It's incredible. You can take a picture of anything bird, animal, plant, bug, butterfly, foot, maybe not your foot, but if you send it in, if you just press a button, it'll tell you what it thinks it is. And it's remarkably right a lot of the time. And if it's not right, it'll get you close. So like I use it with trees and plants because I don't know trees and plants very well. And it helps me at least get a, a start at understanding them. You know, even if it's not exactly right, it'll say, well, like this is a bitter root. So it's in this family and you can, you know, um, Merlin has just gotten better and better. Um, that is incredibly good at IDing photographs. And it's now gotten very good at identifying sound. So you can actually get Merlin and turn on sound ID and I'll just show you what it's hearing as you walk along. So um, using these technologies, we've gotten, one thing that does, by the way, is, and I'll bring this up again in a second, but one of the big drawbacks of community science is you don't know who's doing the reporting. So when you talk to, when I, in the past, when I've talked to the eBird guys, they talk about people as sensors, because that's what they are. They're each individual sensors, but they're unreliable sensors, because you don't know if someone just started birding, or if someone's been birding for 40 years and is, is an expert, or if they're drunk, or if, they're, if it's nighttime and they're stringing, you know, everybody, it happens to everybody. Um, so we don't know exactly what people's ability level and what the conditions are, so we don't know if the data is right but they can do a lot of statistical parsing and stuff that actually corrects for a great deal of that. Uneven coverage. So eBird only works where there are eBirders. So if you go to the middle of Montana, there might not be as many people birding as there are in Cape May where I'm from. Cape May is heavily covered. Um, Data is not always reliable. For example, you might not know what that bird is, right? But you might report it as something. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I heard the answer there. And um, requires uh, active participation and expertise. So again, like you don't know the level of expertise of the person who's doing it. So um, not a problem in terms of birding. I mean, everybody's at different levels in birding. And I think one of the nice things about birding is that it can be fun at so many different levels. But um, it is a problem if you're trying to use people as like a, a sensor. So, I'm, this is a funny, this is gonna be a funny slide because I, it's a question I wanted to ask, but I think that the answer is gonna be skewed here. How many people have banded a bird here? Okay, <laughs> that's supposed to be like one person raising their hand, not like 35. Um, how many people have put a satellite tag on a bird? Uh, damn it, <laughs> somebody back there, all right. Um, how many people have ever heard a bird? All right, there we go. So now we get to bioacoustics, okay? So um, as you probably, as you may or may not know, birds make sounds and each species makes its own sounds. So for example, red start, saw a bunch of those today. Oh yeah. Like and warbler. It's a green heron in flight. And what's this guy? Oh, Dick Sissel. Okay. So those sounds are all different. First two sound kind of similar, but warblers do that. Um, the, um, those are all calls that birds make when they're flying. These are called night flight calls or flight calls. 
And so when these birds are in the air migrating, which usually happens at night, but can also happen during the day, you'll hear sounds that they make. If you know how to listen to those sounds as a person, you can know what birds are flying by. And I can do it a little bit. There's other people like Tom over there or like Michael O'Brien in New Jersey and other expert birders, Pete Dunn and people like that, who can do it very reliably. And they can tell you exactly what's flying over at all times, even if it's just little cheeps and chirps, right? So the sound is a gift that the birds are giving us that we want to utilize, right? We want to use this. Um, they're basically telling us who they are when they fly by. So if we can harness that, well, we can create a huge network of identification that's basically 100%, hopefully, you know, in the 90s plus percent correct. So very accurate sensors um, and tremendous coverage too because it's sound. So it's just anything within a certain distance. It's not gonna be blocked by a tree or obscured by something. If you catch that sound, especially if it's being analyzed by a computer, you can often know what that sound is gonna be, um, you know, 100% of the time. Now this is a funny picture. This is actually oh, some Cape May people. Um, I believe is that David Lapuma? No. Anyway, uh, Sam Gaelic, Glenn, uh, Glenn Davis, uh, Christina Davis, and some people sitting around a, a table in Cape May. This was in the 2009, I think, 2009 or 10, um, making these bucket receivers. Anybody make one of these or have one of these? Yeah, they're pretty cool, right? You take a plastic bucket from um, Home Depot and you take a microphone and you put it in the bucket and you pour some concrete in the bucket to hold the microphone pointing down in there. The microphone is pointing into a little plastic dish and then the wire comes out and goes to a um, recorder and then you wrap cellophane across the top to waterproof it, right? You put that on your roof and it picks up night flight calls for you all night. And then the next morning you have a recording of everything that flew over your house if you know how to read it. The problem is that you then have to read it and you have to initially read it in real time, which means you're listening to this tape coming back. I mean, actually, I talked to someone in really early days who was doing, they're actually doing it on like uh, reel to reel. And so you would have these, you know, you have this big recorder and they have to take it back, play it back in real time and then rewind it and play it back, listening for this stuff. Plus you have to know exactly what every sound is, right? So it's a little tricky, but it's really fun. Well, essentially what that's evolved into for us, or at least for Tara, is a mechanism to actually listen to birds all the time and to identify them accurately. So here's a couple of, um, flight calls, um, so just another couple of flight calls, Thrush and Blackbirdian. And this is what it looks like on a sonogram. So you can see in the picture of the sound, this is a picture of sound, um, the different um, signatures that these make, right? So this actually makes it a little easier to understand, I think, because you can very much see the difference between these, right? They all look different. Um, you know, Blackbird, Song Thrush, Moorhen, Oyster Catcher, Wimbrel. Those are all different patterns. So if you just look at those patterns, you can say, oh, well, that pattern's liberal. So you just put a label on it. So that brings me to Tara. So like I said, I've been working for a couple of years on this project. Um, it's actually, I have here, this is a Tara. So this is the final design for Tara. This is the only prototype we have right now. Um, we're getting the cases printed and what it is inside, just have a hollow inside, right? So this doesn't have because the guts that we have for the prototype are too big to put inside the case. The ones for the real terrors will fit inside the case, but you put the guts in there. We have a microphone on either end here, like a little small mic that sticks out the sides. So you get a stereo effect. We've got these little wind blockers that go in here. So it's a combination of um, fish filter media and something very high tech called spacer mesh. Um, this is a really cool fabric. It's in a family of fabrics that are called 3D fabrics. They're actually woven in three dimensions. So you have an outer layer, an inner layer, and in between you have a whole bunch of fibers woven between. It's all woven together. And so this will block wind, but it won't block sound. 
which is really cool. It's also kind of waterproof. So that goes here. And there's one on each end. So the microphone goes here and the wind blocker goes on top. This little guy goes on top, so it'll look like that on both sides. And then you just plug it in and stick it in your yard um, or on a wall. And it'll listen 24 hours a day and it will pick up sounds. And so it will listen for bird sounds specifically. And what it does is it's going to take those bird sounds and extract them. So if it, it only ex extracts snippets of sound for an analysis. So it's not recording everything continuously, it's just pulling stuff out. Um, it pulls those snippets out, sends it to a server and gets them analyzed, and it tells us what the bird is, right? Wow. So it's pretty cool. It's just like those, um, those pots that we put out, those buckets we put out a decade ago, except that it's automated and it's convenient and small. Um, and so this is how it works. Um, you put it in your yard and a bird sings or a bird does a flight call as it flies over or a radio tag bird goes by and pings it because these devices also have a radio receiver and then that works on the MODIS network. Um, it goes to the Terra network server. The data is sent to a central database and processed with all the other Terra data from around the world. And this is actually, we have about 2,000 orders for Terra right now, including orders in the UK and Europe, Australia. So it's not just a US phenomenon. The majority of our orders are here right now. So you've got all these Terra devices. And then the ID data is shared with the Terra app, which is what the user has, and are also sent to this data available on a big database for people. Um, and then finally, it streams the, so the sound through your own secure network on your app so you can listen to your yard 24 hours a day. So um, my wife, Rebecca, over here in a matching shirt, um, and I drove here on Friday. We intended to leave at about 8 a.m. because it's a nine and a half hour drive. We left at three. So we got in at 1.30 and um, I was pretty wound up from being driving for nine and a half, ten 10 hours. And so um, I couldn't sleep. So I put the app on and um, listened to the stream from Cape May and I went to sleep after a few minutes because I was listening to the ocean sounds and the little birds and stuff and it was really nice. So it creates this great sound environment which you can sort of enjoy at any time. So I, like, I love to have my windows open and we love having the windows open and being able to listen to birds but if it's bad allergy season or if it's winter time or if it's a thunderstorm or whatever, you have to close the windows. And so it's a way to pipe that sound into your house even when you can't be outside. Um, it also does something tricky, um, which is it tricks people into being in nature. <laughs> so technology as in general, as a rule, is, has a lot of benefits, but it can also be very isolating, as we've all seen. Um, and I think that it's creating a sense of separation for a lot of people. The more time you spend on your device, the less time you're sort of present in a natural environment. So we tried to sort of do a little jujitsu on that and flip it around so the technology is actually piping the natural sounds into your house or through your headphones or whatever you want to listen with and get the natural world back into people's lives as a way of encouraging them, one, to learn more about it and be more connected to it, but two, to go outside more. Because I think that the more connected you get to those sounds and those uh, feelings, the more you sort of get interested in going and seeing what's going on out there. And as much as the birding community is our core support community, I mean, they're really the ones who understand this idea and are excited about it and want to support it. I really would love to see this go out to um, a much broader audience. I want to see it go to families with kids, anybody who has a yard, anybody who's curious about birds, people who uh, like to hike and so on, but even just people who are, I wonder what those birds in my yard are, you know, I never really looked into it. And then you've got this um, machine you can put and listen to and it tells you what you're listening to. Um, it'll tell you that's a northern cardinal, that's a, you know, wood thrush and that way it'll actually connect you to that stuff. The more you're connected to birds in your local environment, for example, if you have a nesting cardinal in your yard, the more likely you are to carry about, care about birds on a global scale. So if it's personal, like for example, I 
you know, we watch this cardinal, you know, nest and lay eggs and we watch the babies hatch and grow up and the parents feed them. Then when you read cardinals are in decline globally by 70%, they're not, don't worry. But if they are in decline, some birds are, it help, it creates a personal reaction for people and makes it more emotional and more personal. And I think that will hopefully lead to a stronger conservation community because I think we really need that right now. I also think that, um, you know, if you read, um, what's it called, uh, Habitats for Backyard Birds, is that right? Anyway, a lot of you have probably read it. It's a gardening book, but it talks about how microhabitats have become critical now that a lot of our large scale been fragmented so people's yards become habitats you know and birds use them and so um, encouraging people to understand that and cultivate their yard for wildlife is actually one way that we can help support more territory for birds to use because one of the biggest things that we know is that we lose species and animals because of habitat loss. That's sort of the number one thing that kills stuff off. So we need to see what we can do to cultivate whatever habitat we can for them to sort of help mitigate that trend a little bit. So, okay, tear advantages, you don't have to catch birds. Um, you just have to listen for birds. You just need to hear them. So there's no interaction or physical interaction involved. Um, it's in the moment. So you actually know at the moment what birds are there and it's uh, global. You can set it up anywhere. Um, so what can Terra do for people? Well, first of all, like I said, there's an example of a Terra on a wall or in a yard. That's an older prototype. Um, it can let you, again, connect to the, to the world. Um, you can listen to things and in natural stuff. And like we actually have an app. That's actually a real screenshot from the app. But we have two streams running. We have one running from Cape May uh, Point, And we have one from here at the Biggest Week at a secret location that I'm not going to tell you. And, um, but you can stream those two live at any time. And it'll actually ID the birds that it's hearing as you're looking at it. Um, so those are our curated sites, and actually we're going to have a lot more of those. We're planning on having dozens of curated sites around the world, for example, you know, at uh, nature lodges in Central America or a uh, waterfall in Hawaii or, you know, a watering hole in Africa. So if you want to sort of take a little sonic vacation and listen to one of those places, you can just run that going. I do it when I'm working, actually, and it's great for concentration. Um, you know, sometimes I can't do stuff listening to music because I have to focus more than that. But if I listen to natural sounds, I find myself sort of able to focus, but also sort of having that part of my brain stimulated. Um, also, it's going to be connected to, it's connected to um, Alexa and other things like that. So you can just say, like, what birds were in my yard last night? It's going to tell you. So that's a feature that we're creating as we speak. Wow. Um, I want to bring up something else, which is really important, which I think um, is something we should talk about, which is um, mental illness and depression. I think that we've seen a lot of this in the last three years since the pandemic. 21% um, of adults in the United States now experience mental illness and 6% experience severe mental illness. So those are huge numbers, right? And so um, I think that I'm not saying that something like this will treat or, you know, any severe mental illness. But I can say that we've seen a lot of anxiety and depression rise in our culture in the last few years. And natural sounds have been shown to help reduce anxiety and depression to a degree. And again, like I have personal experience with this. I have, it's well managed now. And I run a peer support group for people with depression. So um, I know very much, I know a lot about it. And I know a lot of people who have those. And I know that um, natural spaces and experiences can be very positive, but it's also very demotivating to have this illness. And so it can be really hard to get out and do something. You sort of need to get yourself to go out and do something, but the, the, the illness has sort of this way of stopping you from doing it, right? So if we have people who are depressed in their house, but they need those you know, natural sounds and stimulation, this is one way we can get that to them. And hopefully, you know, add a little bit of uh, relief to people and also maybe um, boost mental health for people. Shockingly, we've actually seen studies now, and we are seeing a lot more studies about this stuff. It's called ecotherapy, where in Canada right now, they can actually prescribe national parks to people 
who have physical or mental illness as a, um, a wellness prescription. You can say like, you need to go to this park once a day for an hour. They can prescribe it. And um, there are a number and more studies coming that are showing that there are a lot of mental and physical benefits to list, just listening to natural sounds. Being outside is even better, but list, just hearing those sounds, there are specific part of our brains that react to that. You know, we are actually, there's a part of your brain that organizes organic materials automatically and it just does organic materials so animals and plants basically so it's a is an actual region of your brain that does that i talk about it in my taxonomy talk and that little part of your brain will say well that's a cardinal that's a robin i think that's part of why birding can feel really um one of the reasons birding can feel really rewarding is they're sort of like working with that inherent part of our minds that does that. So stimulating that is probably very positive for us. Um, so de the, study that, the studies I've looked at, decreased stress and annoyance, decreased pain, improved mood, and perform better on cognitive tests. In addition to that, actual physical benefits to people in recovery from surgery. So we're seeing like the potential for sound and natural environments um, and the way that they can help people feel better and be happier. And so I hope that um, Tara can contribute to that. Again, I'm not saying we're gonna you know, cure cancer or anything like that, but I think it is something that can contribute to people's happiness. <coughs> Excuse me, and well-being. Um, as far as conservation goes, using bioacoustics like Tara, we'll actually be able to get much more accurate population estimates of birds. Right now, our current estimate, our best estimate as of last year when I researched this, is the number of birds in the world is between 50 and 430 billion birds. So it's a little wiggly, that number. And I think um, having a acoustic net out there that's actually monitoring bird populations will not only tell us much more accurately how many birds there are, but it'll also tell us in real time when there are population changes. So if you see a trend of decrease in population one year, you'll see it that year. We'll be able to read it in real time in comparison to the year before. So say we have you know, a million kinglets migrate from this area in one year and only 800,000 the next year, we'll say, that'll be a flag and we'll say what's happening there. Or if we see two million kinglets the next year, we'll say what's happening there? You know, what's causing these changes? It'll give us a lot more data to work with and a lot more actionable data because actually one thing that's really cool is that bird songs and those little cheeps and chips can actually tell you for some birds, not only the species, but the sex, the um, age, and where the bird is coming from, what region the bird is coming from. So we can actually, that's the science that's being developed right now. And as we gain more information through a, a, something like Terror, any bioacoustic monitoring, we'll have a ton more data to work with and we'll actually be able to refine that to the point, hopefully, that we can say, you know what, the Eastern Canadian population that comes from Ontario, the Ontario region is showing a severe decline what's happening. Then you go to the government agencies and the conservation agencies and say, what's happening in eastern Ontario? What happened? You know, and we can look at that and see root causes and changes that are affecting populations. Or converse, conversely, there's a big boom. You want to see what you're doing right as well as what's going wrong. Um, right now, the ways we can see birds in migration, you guys are probably familiar with this thing. That's a picture of migration on radar, right? Here's eBird's version, BirdCast, which actually shows you, you know, hopefully what you're gonna see the next day. It works about, but um, it does try to predict what the migration is gonna be like that night. It actually does, does give you a pretty good idea of what's happening. That's not for tonight, so don't get excited. Um, and, um, but what if we had a way of saying tonight's flight composition over Cape May was 4,350 red eye vireos, 1,100 yellow rumps, 64 swains and thrushes. These don't tell you anything about what species they are, right? But we could actually get a full species composition of flight and know what they're doing um, on a nightly basis. So, and we could have that going worldwide. Um, there's a lot of bird strikes on windows, right? What if we had a way to um, actually, it's one of the major ways that birds die. Um, what if we had a way to reduce lighting on buildings on nights where there was heavy migration? Um, or low migration, because we can actually tell that by the volume of the sounds that we're hearing. 
um, we could reduce uh, bird strikes by a lot. And they're actually doing that right now with eBird. They're actually in New York City and I believe it's in Houston, is that right? They're doing, um, their maybe, maybe Dallas um, and Chicago, yeah. I know there's uh, several cities that are doing this. We're actually using migration information to um, try and reduce bird strikes on skyscrapers and stuff by turning down lights and those kinds of things. Um, so, so I showed you before, right, there's 1,350 receivers. We have 2,000 teras on order right now. If we can get 10,000, then we're going to have 13,500 MODIS receivers. So we're going to actually increase the MODIS network by a power of 10 by putting out receivers all over the country in people's yards. Because each one of these little teras will pick up radio signals, and so it'll help us expand that network of banded birds by a lot, which is a major, you know, one of the major drawbacks of that system. So if we can increase those number of sensors, it would be great. Um, and finally, it's not just birds. So lots of animals make sound. Bats, frogs, that small um, and um, so uh, cicadas. So we can actually use this technology to measure all kinds of populations and behaviors. Um, frogs, bats, insects, all that stuff. I mean, I'm pushing very hard right now to get a frog ID system onto Terra so that we can actually ID all the frogs that we hear because they are particularly vocal and they're super cool. Um, bats is another thing that we've actually already had people asking us for and we are working on that right now. It requires an ultrasonic microphone and processing, but it's certainly not at all out of the question. It's a little, little complicated, but something that we could um, do. And um, so yeah, there's a ton of potential there. And honestly, I really don't know what the potential of Terra is. I mean, I think that I can see it doing a lot for bioacoustics and a lot for um, all the things that I've mentioned today, for people's well-being, for you know, animals and plants and uh, animals and habitats and so on. I didn't mention this actually, but we have little sensors that will attach to Terra so you can actually um, have the temperature of your soil, your soil moisture, the local, like the microclimate of your yard, like the weather and humidity, the wind, we can do flooding um, and uh, amount of sun in spots, like so you can basically like garden sensors and that kind of stuff. That information can also get leverage for us to see what people's habitats are doing and how the birds react to them. You know, which habitats seem to attract birds more by certain compositions or, you know, qualities and which ones attract them less. So. I don't know what Terra is going to lead to, um, but I'm very excited to have a community of people who are interested in it, and I feel very privileged to be able to contribute to that group. And I'm really seeing a lot of big things for Terra, so I hope you do too. And I want to thank you guys for joining me tonight to talk about it. Thank you.